Thank you, John. And um, thank you, Colin, for that wonderful welcome to country. And I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people um, and their elders, past and present, and thank them for the, the land management that they have been doing that we need to emulate. Uh, my name's Kate Fitzherbert. I work at Bush Heritage Australia, which is a national not-for-profit organisation. And our uh, job is basically to bring country back to good health. And we do that in a couple of ways, by buying land and looking after it as re in reserves and also by partnering with other people, particularly with traditional owner groups. So what we're going to talk about in the next little while is the open standard for the, the practice of conservation. And I'm going to start by um, basically letting you into a few bush heritage secrets about the difficulties that we've had in the past in managing conservation projects that we run over uh, 1.2 million hectares of land which we own and manage. Um, then we'll go into the open standard and go through the step-by-step -step process uh, which you'll see is a really disciplined, logical way of thinking about your conservation project. And we have found that it has been a, it's been transformative for us. Uh, <clears throat> um, at the end, we'll have some questions. So if you've got questions about the Open Standard, there are a number of people here who can, and can help you answer those. Um, so this cycle of management is probably familiar to some of you. There are many organisations who've used this process of think what you're trying to do, plan what you want to do, do it, analyse and adapt, and then share what you've, you've done. And we've actually often been quite good at the first two steps, um, and we're often very good at the implement step, but we don't often connect the two together. And we haven't been very good at the analyse, adapt and the share and the learn. So the open standards gives us a really um, effective way of going around that process. So from a bush heritage perspective, what were the challenges that we had in managing our conservation <coughs> projects? And probably many of you will have, have um, found similar things. Were we really clear about what we were trying to achieve? Not always. Where should we actually focus our efforts? We had lots of really good ideas, lots of things we wanted to do, but were we actually um, focusing where the needs were greatest? And we had lots of plans, but often they had no clear priorities. And if we have changes in staff, often the priorities would shift with the interests of the new staff. How did we know really what funding we needed for the long term? It's an easy enough to prepare a budget, um, but often that budget wasn't really closely aligned to the works on the ground, um, and we needed to raise the money to do the work and not allow the funding opportunities to drive what we did. We also wanted to know how, how we were going. Were we actually achieving anything? And it's quite hard to know what track we were on sometimes. And that was, again, dependent on who was doing the work. Some people had particular uh, strengths in some areas, so that was where they were focused. But was that actually what we wanted to be doing? And as a result of this uncertainty, it was actually quite difficult to report back to donors. <laughs> And we were monitoring lots of stuff, and it was really fun. And we liked being out in the bush, but were we actually monitoring what we needed to monitor? Were we able to answer with that monitoring information the questions that we were actually asking? Well, not always. The other problem was that we had, as we changed staff, we didn't have a really good way of capturing all the knowledge and the thinking that had gone into our management planning, which meant that if you lost a staff member, you often lost all this corporate knowledge. And the new staff had to start all over again. 
So we found that we were reinventing wheels and we were just uh, not making the progress that we should have been making. So in the, in the realisation of all these shortcomings, we thought we needed to find a process that would help us through all these challenges. And we came across, sort of serendipitously really, the open standard for the practice of conservation. And it looked like it was going to answer all those, those questions. So we have over the last, this was the situation we found ourselves in in 2011. And now in 2017, we have six years of using the open standard and it has transformed the way we do our work. It's actually answered every single one of those problems for us. So what we'll do now is actually take you through a sort of a, a quick journey through the open standard cycle and its logic. And so you can see that if this is something you think is really useful to you, it might be the way to go in the future. So we start with the conceptualised step. Understand the situation that you're working in. There are a number of steps in this process. The first one is to define your team. Think about the skills you need to do the project. Think about the stakeholders that you need to engage with because conservation is really about people and if you get the right people and you get them involved, then your project is going to be much more likely to be successful. So you, in, a, in a local context, you might be thinking about the team members. They might be land care groups, property owners, traditional owner groups. There might be state agencies, regional experts and advisors, and there'll be other stakeholders. Once you're confident about the team and the skills that you need, then you need to look at the scope. What actually are we doing with this project? Where are we working? And you might have a geographic scope. It may be a catchment. It may be just a, a defined land care area. Or it might have a thematic scope. For instance, if you're trying to save orange-bellied parrots, uh, you'll be looking at a more thematic scope because you're working in Tasmania and you're also working in Victoria and South Australia. If you're a land care group, um, you'll be looking at your land care area and where you have, have influence. So define your scope. Set yourself a vision. Where do you want to be in the end? If you could project out 20 years or 30 years, what would you want to see? If you could come back and say, that project was really successful, well, what is that vision? And it's actually really nice to be visionary in a vision. So one that we've pulled up from um, one of the land care things is a vision like this, that our catchment is healthy and a vibrant ecosystem with diverse and abundant flora and fauna, fertile, stable soils and clean rivers and creeks, which provide a rich natural heritage for future generations. Now, if we could achieve that, we'd feel like we'd done a pretty good job. The next step in this process is to actually choose the targets, and you might call them assets or values. In the open standards, the terminology is targets, and Bush Heritage has sort of adopted the targets, so I'll talk about targets. Um, but you need to think carefully about the things that you care about. There's lots and lots of things we need to do. But if you think carefully about the key targets, where you're going to put your efforts and where you're going to put your energies, you can actually have a much broader impact. So together, when you've selected the targets, they should actually sort of represent all the biodiversity in your project area. So for the, the um, purposes of this presentation, we're going to look at two targets. One of them is waterways and riparian vegetation, and one of them is arboreal mammals. But there's certain ways that you can um, select your targets. And um, it's a really good idea to start looking at ecosystems because often the species things are the ones that jump out to people. But if you look at the ecosystem and you can do good management in the ecosystem, you'll find that all the species will sort of fall in underneath. So those are actually, as we call, nested targets. So if you're looking at grasslands, you'll be looking at those species underneath. But by managing the grassland well, 
those species will be accommodated. It's also a good idea to not select too many, and the temptation is to have a whole lot of targets, but if you can keep it to eight or fewer, then you're actually able to be more, set your priorities more easily and be more focused. And you can always start with some and then come back in a few years later and add more. You can actually lump some of the targets. If they all co say they co-occur in the landscape, they require similar ecological processes, they have similar viability and similar threats, you can bring them together. And it might be something like, you know, fish and mussel assemblages or... Um, Actually, I'll just go back again. No, I won't. I'll just stay where I am or I'll get into trouble. Um, they might be the grasslands with the grassland nesting birds and they all come together. So the management actions that you will take for the grasslands are appropriate for the, for the species underneath, underneath them. Uh, so the assumption is basically that by focusing on the, the main targets, there will be a high likelihood of conserving the vast majority of the, of the living organisms in that region. So one of the other key elements, and this is actually a really important part of this process in terms of monitoring, is looking at the viability of those targets to define a characteristic of their ecology or biology which you can measure and which tells you the... Um, state of the health of the target. And we call that a key ecological attribute. So, for instance, for our arboreal mammals target, our key ecological attribute might be the presence of hollow bearing trees, because without them, we're not going to have our arboreal mammals. So, the key ecological attribute um, is the aspect of that targets biology or ecology, which if changed or missing, is going to impact on the health of that target. And they need to be things we can measure. So this is where we start looking at how we're bringing the monitoring in. When we have a target we need to, and we have a key ecological attribute that applies to that target, we need to know what we're going to measure. And that becomes our indicator. So it's the thing that we select that we can then measure. And part of the development of this viability analysis is rating the current health of the target and providing a range of indicator ratings that tell us whereabouts it is. So for arboreal mammals, our key attribute is the hollow bearing trees the indicator we're going to use is a measure, the number of hollow bearing trees per hectare, and our current status is poor. And then we work out, well, actually we don't put our status in yet, we look at our indicator rating. So if, if it's what we think is less than or fewer than three hollow bearing trees per hectare is poor, between four and 10 is near fair, 10 to 20 is good, and greater than 20 is very good. At the moment, we, and then we can go out and we can do our first measure. And that will tell us what our current status is. So at the moment, we're going to say, OK, our status is poor. How do we bring that up to where we want to be, which is good? And it might be for this particular case in this, for the interim, that we have to supplement the habitat with nest boxes or whatever it is. But over years and working with that woodland or forest, <clears throat> we might be able to bring up the natural um, hollow bearing tree number. If we look at um, the other target, which is the waterways and riparian vegetation, we do the same thing. We select a key ecological attribute, and it might be related to the size or condition or the landscape context. We select an indicator, that thing we're going to measure, and in this case, um, we might have an indicator which relates to the health of the waterways and we might use aquatic invertebrates or the presence of aquatic invertebrates as our key attribute. 
The indicator we're going to use is, is the diversity of those aquatic invertebrates. And this is all hypothetical. I don't know anything about aquatic sampling, so forgive me for the dodgy numbers if they're dodgy. Uh, it's just there for an, as an example. Um, we might measure where we are at the moment. And with our experience and with the knowledge of others, we can, we can basically say in this type of environment, we would expect to see in a really health env healthy environment this many um, aquatic invertebrates per sampling area. And we can therefore rate where we are now and where we want to get to. And what that means is as we do our management work, we've got a reference point where we can see how far we're tracking to get to where we want to go. Once we're comfortable that we're, we understand the health of our, the current rating of the health of our targets, we actually look at the direct threats. So why is it that we have these targets or assets that are threatened and um, they need management work? So identifying your direct threats, and these are things which are man or human induced. So there will be other risks and, and threats, um, natural predation by um, owls or things if you're an arboreal mammal, but we're not worrying about those. We're looking at those things which are induced by human activity. So in the case of the waterways and riparian vegetation, it might be erosion. And the main cause in the area we're working in might be stock access into that riparian zone, stock in the creek. Say for arboreal mammals, it might be firewood cutting. So once we've identified the threats, and remembering that we've only got limited resources, we need to prioritise them. We need to know that we're working on the ones that need our help the most. And by prioritising our threats, we, we do it on a series of ratings around the scope, the extent to which that threat is active, the severity, what is the impact that it's having, is it a severe impact or is it a relatively light impact, and what's the permanence. If this happens, how easy is that to reverse? Like if we're going to put in a car park, not so much. If it's something else, then maybe it is easy to reverse. And the rating that you're, this is done in the software, Marathi, which I'll talk about a little bit later, this gives you a rating. So you, you make an assessment of the scope, the severity and the permanence of this um, threat, and then you'll get a rating. And what that does is it will put a rating into your threat table which says, this is the highest threat for these targets. And therefore, that's telling you this might be the one to focus our attention and our resources on first. Now this is a very simplistic um, threat rating table, if only they were all this simple. But this is one that, that comes out of the Marathi software when you've put your targets in and you've put your threats in and you've done your assessment of the ranking of the threats, you end up with a table. That shows you whether you've got a very, um, an issue where the threats are high or high or medium or low. This one I've just pulled out of another one of our projects so you can see that there is a range. We've, got, we've identified a number of, of um, targets across the top, threats down the side, and you can see that there are some that are low. The threats are considered low in the ranking. There are medium, high, and very high threats. And this is a way of saying, OK, how, how will we distribute resources? Will we, on, if we're looking at um, upland logging as a threat, for, say, the seagrass beds, will we focus our attention there when the threat is low? Well, probably not. If we're looking at unsustainable fishing by local people for seagrass beds, maybe that's where we need to, we need to put our attention. So this is a, a decision support tool about where you invest. Once we've looked at the threats, we then go through the process of, of putting together what's called a situation analysis, looking at the much the broader political, environmental, social, cultural 
um, context in which we're doing this project. And this is actually a really, really useful thing to do. And it's a wonderful way of bringing your stakeholders into the planning process because everyone has a different perspective about the, the project in the, in the area. They'll bring all sorts of knowledge and information to this process. And it's also a great way of building a um, commitment and involvement in your project. So we start by having our uh, targets there, we put our threats in, and then we start looking at those factors which are causing those threats to be active. So for instance, for our erosion threat, where we've got st stock access in the riparian zone, um, the reason that we've got this happening is that the landowners actually depend on the river water for their stock. They also have inadequate fencing, perhaps. Maybe there are properties there that the fences have collapsed. Maybe the landowners don't have the funds for alternative stock fencing or for um, putting in new ways of getting water to their stock. There's no incentive for them to do that. They just, if they don't have the funding and there's no incentive scheme, well then how do they, how do they achieve that? Maybe there's also a lack of knowledge or of concern about the ecological impacts that they're having. Maybe the information's not available to them, or if it is available to them, they're not that interested in it. And what this does is starts to show you the story around the cause of the threats and gives you a much clearer idea about where you can intervene. If we take the next one, firewood cutting, Wood heaters are really popular at the moment. Well, why, why are wood heaters really popular? Well, we have rising costs of electricity. There is a real social context around wood, wood heaters. Therefore, we have a demand for firewood. And there are all sorts of other factors in there. The cost of firewood from licensed and other suppliers. The legislation in Victoria now, I don't think it's changed, now allows some people to collect firewood in state forests, which means that they may not have a distinction between where they can and where they can't collect firewood. There's unmanaged access into private forests and woodlands, and there's also a lack of knowledge about the impact of collecting firewood. So again, it starts to show you the story around why those threats are active. And if we go back to the erosion, whoops, I'm just going to go backwards. Oh, not that far. This could be bad. Okay. I'm being challenged by the technology here. Okay. That's where I want to be. <laughs> so um, what it does, it gives you a really logical intervention point. So if we take the erosion one, perhaps the th one of the things we need to invest time and effort in is to develop an incentive program um, for, oh my God. Okay, I'm changing, sorry, apologies. Okay. All right, it's all right. I'm just not catching up with my presentation. Um, so what it does, it gives us a point where we can intervene. So we take, we take the stock access into riparian corridor example and we now start thinking in more detail about what we're going to do. So we start to develop a goal for where we want to be, we start thinking about some strategies and then we move on to, to thinking about objectives. So our goal for the, in this case might be that by 2022, we want to have um, our stream invertebrate numbers up to where they should be for a healthy environment. So we want to develop a strategy for how we're going to do that. And we think about the activities we're going to need to do to implement that strategy. And this is where this wonderful thing called the results chain 
comes in. And Stu is going to go into a lot more detail about the results chain in the workshop this afternoon, so I'm going to sort of rip through this a little bit. Um, but the results chain is a way of checking your logic. We're going to set up uh, an incentive program for putting fences on um, to protect riparian zone. We think if we do that, then we'll be able to revegetate the, the riparian strips. If we revegetate the riparian strips, we'll get a, a better habitat um, developing along the river. We'll get the, the insects and things falling back into the river to provide the food for the animals. Therefore, we should get an increase in the number of our aquatic invertebrates and the insects and things on the stream sides. Therefore, we should be able to increase um, our riparian, the health of our um, river aquatic invertebrates. So there's a sort of a logic in that thinking. But maybe there's some flaws in that logic as well. So one of the things about a results chain is you go through this a logical process of saying, well, if we do this, then that we expect this will happen. And we want to know whether the strategy and the logic of our thinking is going to get us to the end point. And as we're doing that, we can actually start to put objectives in. So, okay, by if we're going to do this strategy by December 2018, we're going to have an incentive program in place. And we're going to have it funded for three years. Sounds pretty ambitious. Okay, but that's our objective. That's what we're going to work towards. So that's a result. And if we can achieve that result, then we reckon that we'll be able to reduce the threat by... And it's say by 2022, we're going to have 10 kilometres of previously grazed river frontage fenced with at least a 20 metre wide strip of riparian veg on each bank. So that's going to be how we're going to help abate the threat. And that's going to have an impact on our target. So by 2024, we're going to have stream invertebrates back to the diversity that they should have been. And we can go through this logical process and see whether we've got any... Um, assumptions in there which are going to trip us up along the way. And this is one way of actually building a monitoring plan. If I just go back one, you can see that what we're doing now is actually identifying the things we have to measure. So we're going to have to measure stream invertebrates because we're going to need to know whether they're up to the levels we expect them to be for the, in a healthy system. We're actually going to have to measure the areas that we're fencing because we need to be able to know that we've got 10 kilometres of, of um, reach, river reach protected. Uh, and we're going to have some um, achievement measure for actually having set up our incentive system. So it, it's the beginnings of your monitoring plan. And why do we do a monitoring plan? Because we need to know that all this investment we're putting into it, time and money, is actually getting us where we want it to go. So we need to know who we're talking to with our monitoring. It's the team. The team needs to know whether it's working. The manager of the team needs to know that it's working. The funder of the team needs to know that the, the work is, is, is getting the results that, that um, were intended. We need to make sure that the questions that those, the team and the managers and the, and the funders are asking are going to be answered by the monitoring that we're doing. So we don't want to end up with some great results, but it's actually not telling us what we need to know. And this is a way of sort of prioritising and check, refining your indicators to make sure that they are answering the questions. Then we can select the methods. How are we going to actually sample for aquatic invertebrates? Uh, and many of you will have much more experience in this than me. I have almost none. But we also know, need to think at this stage about how we're going to analyse that data. So we need to collect data which we can analyse to give us the answers to the questions we're asking. Then we need to determine when are we going to do the monitoring, where are we going to do the monitoring, who's going to collect the data, and who's going to do the analysis. And it's really worth remembering to factor into work plans that analysis often takes three times as long as the data collection. And so often we forget to allocate time for the analysis. So here's an example of what might be a, a monitoring plan for this project. We've got our target goal there. 
What do we met with the indicator is we're measuring stream invertebrates, how standard water and su substrate sampling methods. We're going to do it in summer because that's when we know that we're going to get the most, um, the best results. Who's going to do it? Melbourne Water, bless them. Um, we, where are we going to do it? We're going to do it in the existing monitoring sites because they have historic monitoring sites along the river. And we, as a comment, we're going to say, OK, we need to send this report to the landholders who are involved because this is the way we're going to keep them involved with the project. We're going to keep them motivated. We also have a threat a bait and objective here on the 10 kilometres of Gray's River frontage. So the indicator is the extent of area fenced over the, the river reach length. We're going to just do that using GPS waypoints and mapping. And we're going to do that at the completion of each of the fencing and revegetation re projects. Who's going to do it? The project office is going to do it. At each of the project sites, it's going to be done. And then we're actually going to submit our report to the funding agency annually. So this is where we start to see the people, the uh, investment of time, uh, the, how, and who are the stakeholders that are involved. I just thought I would add this in because this is um, Hugh Possingham, many of you will have heard of, and his seven deadly sins of monitoring, and there are actually eight. But they're really interesting because he said, he says about monitoring, these are the things you should watch for. And that's actually ignoring the option of not monitoring. Do we really need to monitor this? Or are we just, um, do we, do we, well, monitoring the obvious. We don't actually, we, we monitor because we are in the habit of monitoring, but is it actually going to tell us something? Or can we monitor less often? And then also failing to have a control site for confirming you, the results of your actions so you can demonstrate that what you have done has changed the situation. And back to the first one, really, monitoring to, to prove the obvious. And the example he gave when he was talking about this was, we're still monitoring southern right whales going past the east coast of Australia, and we know that their trajectory is going up and up and up and up. And it's still going up and up and up, and we still monitor them. And, and maybe we don't need to monitor them every year anymore, maybe we can monitor them every five years. Maybe that's enough. So it's about using the resources you've got to the best advantage. His number four is ignoring the full cost of monitoring. And it is an expensive thing in time, and it's an expensive thing in data analysis, and that does need to be factored into your um, work plans. Talking to people who are not applied, who don't understand the on-ground situation when you're doing your analysis. Having no action that would be taken as a result of the, what you're finding out. Don't just find stuff out for the sake of finding stuff out. Make sure that what you're monitoring is actually going to tell you something that will give you information to change what you're doing to improve what you're doing. Failing to quantify things. I can't quite remember the context of that one. And then failing to have clear and concise logic. And that's where the results chain is so valuable because it tests your logic. Once you've got a monitoring plan, you've almost really started to get your operational plan. And this is the next step in the open standard, where you start looking at what funding is required, what are the people that you need, what are the skills you need to have, what are the risks that you need to manage, and this is around um, health, safety and environment, or oh &S, as well as other things, loss of staff, and how long is the, are we going to fund the project? How long is it going to last? At the end of that, using the Marathi software, you can actually print off a paper management plan. So if you're one of these people who likes to have a piece of paper in the car to refer to, you can take that with you. We then get on to the implement step, and this is where we start putting all the fine detail into the work plan. So we've identified specific activities that we have to do, and we need to look at who will do them and how much it's going to cost and how long will it take. So to start with, we look at the people. So we've got these activities. We're going to develop an incentive scheme. Who's going to do that? Well, Melbourne Water's going to do that. And we reckon it's going to take them 50 days. Then we need to contact our landowners. And they're going to, Melbourne Water and, and Landcare are going to co coordinate on that. 
and we reckon that's going to take someone 20 days through the next year. Then we're going to start doing the fencing and we reckon that we can do the allocation of fencing and there's going to be 30 days a year in that. So we start to get a picture of the resourcing that we need. And we've also got in here our monitor and analyse data time is allocated. Then we start putting some costs against it and we reckon that to develop this incentive scheme with its 50 days, it's going to cost us about $50,000 in resourcing. And so you go and you start to step by step build up a picture of the budget that you're going to need to achieve this goal. And in the Marathi software, this is what it ends up looking like. So you have um, the results chain at the top as your guide. We are working on the weed, the weed work um, control results chain. The strategy is actually the weed control. And these are the steps we're going to take. This actually, actually one has come out of our Scottsdale Reserve plan. Work units in the orange a progress assessment which comes into Marathi, we're on track. The blue, the sort of bluey green, is the project expenses that we expect to spend and then the budget, one at the end, is the budget totals for the years that that project is going to continue. If you look at it at the work plan level, coming down a bit in terms of adding your people in, we've got a number of our staff and volunteers here we have allocated hours for them on this project and these little green symbols indicate the costs. And so this is sort of a bit sliced off, but at the very end you can see that there are costs in there against each of those people and those actions. And you end up with a total at the end. So you add in your people, you add in your costs, and at the end, you've got a paper, if you want it, you've got a work plan and budget which you can take with you. Then the most important part of the whole process is that you go ahead and you do the implementation. And there's one thing about planning is that often the implementation side is really where people want to focus their efforts. But if you think that you're implementing over three or four years, the time that you spend in planning is the most cost effective and um, time that you can spend on that project. Relatively, it costs you very little. It's your staff time. It, you might have to pay for stakeholders to come in. But the value you get out of the planning will more than compensate for any of the, the sort of the planning fatigue stuff that happens because it will make your implementation so much more effective and you could actually save yourself months, if not years, of work. So take the two days, five days, ten days, whatever it is to do the planning well and then your implementation will be so much more effective. The final bit, of course, well, not the, quite the final bit, but the, the really key thing here is to analyse and adapt. And this is also where, at Bush Heritage, we've tended to, to be a bit lax, though we're getting onto that now. We love collecting the data, we've got lots of data, but we don't do things with it. Um, so we need to know, are we doing the right things? Are we doing them well? Are we achieving what we set out to achieve? So and putting time and effort into thinking about how you're going to analyse the data at the beginning is absolutely critical because you don't want to end up with buckets of data and you think, well, actually, that was good to pick up, but we don't need to use it. It's not telling us what we need to know. So we need to analyse the results and we need to analyse the assumptions behind those results and we need to look at those in relation to our... Um, effort, staff effort, are we getting the results we expected with the effort that, that we've put in? Do we need more resources? Have we done, with the money we've got, have we got the outputs that we should have got? And we need to document that and we need to feed what we've learned back into the plan. And this is another thing that we're only starting to really get our head into, is what we learn needs to be put back into the plan so 
as um, I think it was Rob said, we don't just keep on doing the same thing and expecting a different result. We're learning from what we do. We adapt the plan to get a better outcome. And then we communicate and we share. So that in forums like this, with your colleagues, with partners, with other stakeholders, we're sharing and we're transparent about what, what worked and what didn't work. Because you folk need to know what we've tried and what didn't work, so you don't do the same thing. And we need to know what you found worked so we can use that information. And the more we share this information, the more effective we'll become. So we need to document our results and our lessons, send out that information to our key audiences, and report regularly, and particularly to our funders for organisations like Bush Heritage, which we really need to keep our funders involved and informed about what we're doing. And we need to do sort of lessons learned and evaluations and audits at the appropriate time. Um, and so in that case, hey, we, we close the loop. And as we're going through our analyze and adapt, if it's working, we can just go back and we can keep implementing and monitoring. If we're not sure that it's quite right, we might need to go back and change some of the actions and the monitoring stuff we're doing. And if we really have got it all wrong, we need to go back to the conceptualised step, say, OK, let's rethink this. It's not working. Um, just to finish up, um, the Marathi software is a desktop at the moment, a desktop system which you have on your desktop, which takes all this inf planning information. So one of the things that things that the Bush Heritage struggled with was we do this planning and it would sit in a document and the document would sit on the shelf and it wouldn't be referred to. And then we would often lose the conversation around the planning. Maradi al allows you to record all that so you don't lose those little gems of information that come up through the planning process. There is also software now, Maradi Share, which means that the plans sit in the cloud. And this is particularly relevant as we start to work in partnership on different projects because our plans sit in the cloud. Our reserve manager in Western Australia has as easy access to them as we do in the Melbourne office. We can both download, we can change the plan, we put it back in the cloud. And that means that agencies can do, they can share a plan. So it may well be that Melbourne Water and Parks Vic are working on a project, they have the project in the cloud, they both have access to it. They both have equal ownership of it and responsibility for it. So the Marathi share capacity has opened the opportunity for much more effective partnerships. Um, if you're interested in working in the open standard, there is a whole suite of, of resources available to you. Lots of guidance and training materials on the web, um, the Marathi software web page, the Marathi shared web page, the Conservation Coaches Network, which is actually a global network. There is a Conservation Coaches Network Australia where conservation practitioners will come and assist you in building your plan and guiding you through the open standard process. And then there are um, agencies such as Conservation Management who are particularly helping traditional owner groups of whom Stu is a, a uh, director <coughs> and he'll be able to give you more information on that if you're interested. So I'll leave it there and I think we had five minutes for questions, is that right? If anyone's got any questions. Just wondering if you, if you did a pie chart of, of the, the the circle, um, how much would implementation be of, in cost? Of, of, like, you know, of the, the cost of the various aspects of the of the oh. process. Would, would you have a guess at that? It's up. I'd, you know, I'd be putting it at 85, 80, 85. Of the implementation. Ninety percent. Yeah, is implementation. Yeah, I reckon. Yeah, it's a <coughs> little bit of a, you know, how long's a piece of string sort of thing. So, but for a, you know, for a 10 year multi-party project, you know, you're talking about millions of dollars, you, know, you might spend you know, 
hundred, two hundred thousand on the planning, and then you then you're directing several million dollars worth of work. So it's a you know, the planning's a small portion, um, implementation a larger portion. I think Kate would probably agree we don't we don't yet allocate enough within projects to the monitoring and evaluation. That's still seen as the small part. Uh, need. We, uh, I reckon, somewhere between 50 and 25 percent of your budget really needs to go into that. Um, I have a question about allocating resources. You had um, a point where you said it's a decision support tool, and you had very high ratings for some things, high and so on. Yeah. But hadn't taken into account the cost and difficulty of doing things, or the likelihood of their effectiveness. Um, that seemed to be a gap, and I can find that that's a gap. You know, you look at various things and you think, oh yeah, blackberries are a high priority, we'll put lots of resources into that. That's probably a bad example. Wandering trad yeah. is, a, is a bad problem. But you don't necessarily put a lot of effort into it because it's difficult, has toxicity problems, <laughs> and you probably won't succeed anyway. So how do you put in those extra factors well, within this system? Yeah, I mean, this is a bit of a quick journey. <coughs> but there are ways of, there are um, processes in there for assessing the effectiveness of each of your strategies against cost and um, threat rating. So there are mechanisms in there to do that. So we, have, we actually have a strategy <coughs> support tool where you can assess this strategy is going to cost this much with this many people, and it's the threat is ranked here. How do we assess the effectiveness of that given all those different variables? So yes, there is a mechanism in there to do that. Yeah. Yes, up the back. Okay. In, in implementing these projects, and I know the sheriffs do a number of excellent projects across Australia. How much have you been able to include your monitoring of? of project success in the implementation stage of the works. So you, you monitor in box there, you come for more analysis than actually it's sending people out to go look at something where an implementation team may have already been. Yep. Um, it's a good question. And we're just, just at the point, really, where we're starting to do that. Because the way that, that we've done this in the past is that we have what we call a five-year ecological review, which is after five years of activity, now, I'm not saying this is right, and I don't think it is, but this is what we have done, that after five years you do a major review and then you feed that information back into the plan. And we are certainly doing that with a number of our properties and as a consequence of that analysis, we have made changes to what the, the management actions that we take. What we're trying to do now is actually to have an annual, quicker sort of review um, and one that's actually really all more ongoing so that the staff are now putting in progress reports, which you can do straight into Marathi and actually straight into Marathi Share now. So at the end of every fortnight, they put in a progress report. And it might be mostly output stuff, like we put up 16 kilometres of fencing. But it also might be we have seen this species back in here for the first time in five years. So you're starting to get an indication that what you're doing is actually effective. Um, but I would say that probably on 80% of our projects now, we've actually gone around the cycle and the things that have come out of the monitoring are being fed back into the plan so that we're adjusting the plan to respond to things we've found out through that previous three or four, five years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, we're so? out of time. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to take any other questions later if that's helpful for people. I'll leave that. Thank you very much.